Hello, everyone, and thanks for making time to attend our presentation. So the title of the presentation is actually the title of a book that was published this week by Morgan and Claypool, Library Link Data in the Cloud. And it's a part of a series called Synthesis Lectures on the Semantic Web. And as we were writing the book, we took seriously the thought that we were both synthesizing and lecturing. And so the book is organized as a set of lectures that could be delivered as a, as a mini course. And we could even imagine doing exercises with them. But today, we'll just give you an overview that highlights some of the big themes that, that the book discusses. I, I wanted to point out that every now and then, you'll see slides with a green background. Those are um, headings of the major sections or chapters in the book. So with that behind us, let's get started. Um, this book has three authors, but in fact, we have a lot of collaborators at OCLC. And here are some of the people who have made major contributions to this work. In addition, we work with colleagues from Montana State University, uh, Kenning Arlich and Patrick O'Brien, on their grant-funded work that is about improving the visibility of, of libraries and the web. And, and I'll point out here that Jeff Mixter is actually formally a member of their team. But this book is not a formal deliverable from their project. So any missteps we made, it's certainly not their fault. So the, the first section of the book, and this is actually the title of chapter one, is called Library Standards and the Semantic Web. Um, and it tries to tell the story of how um, the, the linked data work emerges not only from the semantic web in general, but also how the library community has reacted to it. And it's a long story, and I suspect that it's, in hindsight, it's the topic of a book in its own right. But, but we tried to capture a lot of detail that, that we could see. Um, throughout the book, we wanted to give the sense of people talking. And we wanted to do that to remind people that even though we're focusing on OCLC's work, that this work is actually happening in a lot of rich community discussion. Now, we didn't do interviews, but for this iteration, we didn't really need to because much of the action is happening on blog posts, in presentations, on listserv discussions, and so on. So lots and lots of gray literature that had to be synthesized in order to create this story. So what I, I'm showing you here is a, is a quote from a very important blog post by Tim Berners-Lee in 2006, in which he tried to lay out the principles of, of, of linked data. And we'll get into that later. But here, I just want to emphasize the bottom line, which is that the semantic web is about making links so that a person or a machine can explore the web of data. Now, in an earlier publication, which was published in Scientific American in 2002, the author, Tim Berners-Lee, and a couple of co-authors gave a very crisp explanation for why the semantic web is important. So what they said there was that the semantic web attempts to make actionable what was merely displayed. And so even in 2002, they were already envisioning that the familiar web of documents could be turned into something much more compelling. So rather than just going to a search engine and finding a web, a web of documents that you would have to wade through, they were already imagining that the, the data that you see on the web could be turned into something machine processable that, that could then do useful work for you. And so this project is, is about the useful work that can be done with the web of data in the library community. And linked data is just the current technology for implementing the vision of the semantic web that's been there for a long time. So some more anchoring. Um, this is the cloud that is mentioned in, in, in the title. And it's the familiar cloud diagram maintained by lodcloud.net. And it's, and it's deliberately fuzzy at this point because we're looking at it from 50,000 feet above. But there are still, even at this view, there are some things that are worth pointing out. So one is that the circles represent data sets 
that have been modeled using linked data principles. And over time, um, there have become more and more of these circles. And so this cloud gets denser and denser over time. The second thing that's important to notice here is that they're organized so that they coalesce around a clear center. And that center is here. And what we have at the center are the linked data sets that are especially important because they contained many, many links into and out of them. So they're the ones that have, have won the popularity contest in a sense. And here we see two that are, that are important and are mentioned in our data as well as many other people's data. The first is DBpedia, which is the machine processable data that was automatically harvested from Wikipedia. The second is GeoNames, and that is a, a geographic database with about 8 million place names, which is widely becoming a de facto standard for geo, geospatial and geographic information. So the portion that we're interested in is over here, and this circle um, draws it includes more than what we're really interested in, but we can now focus in more closely on that. And that's the yellow and, or, or the green and blue-green circles that you see in, in the colored picture. And this segment represents the linked data, data sets that have been contributed by libraries, publishers, others interested in bibliographic resources, and people who are interested in the scholarship around linked data. So drawing the line there is roughly more, is supposedly more accurate. But we want to zero in on this even more and look at the linked data sets that are closer to the center, closer to DBpedia. And if we draw a circle here, we see um, contributions from national libraries, a lot of them in Europe. We see contributions from the Library of Congress, including the Library of Congress subject heading. We see a couple of OCLC data sets. We see VIOF, we see WorldCat. And then around the edges in blue, we see some of the contributions from academic communities. And so, for example, WordNet is there. And I, I have to say that as a linguistics graduate student in the 1980s, we studied WordNet. And so WordNet seriously predates the linked data world. And um, another one that the circles kind of cover up is Lexbo, which is a, another um, data set that has been produced by by um, researchers doing computational lexicography. And, and the data set becomes widely referenced in experimental linked data, data sets that get published. So the broadest question that we would want to answer in this book is, what can we say about the linked data sets that have been contributed to libraries? What are their internals? How widely are they used? How big are they? What um, has OCLC contributed to this, and how are our data sets used? That's the biggest question that this book is about. But we also had a more concrete reason for writing this book, and it has to do with the linked data that was published on WorldCat in 2012. And I'll just put it up here. I know it's probably not readable, but even if I made the slide bigger, it still wouldn't be readable because this is machine processable data, and that's the point. So in 2012, OCLC published the first draft of the RDF statements that can be automated, automatically generated from catalog records accessible from worldcat.org. So in our slang that we use internally, we say that, that MARC records were shredded into statements about entities, and we may say that several more times in this presentation. So this was, and it still is, the largest linked data set published by the library community. So the main thing we wanted to accomplish in this book is a researcher's account of this result. So where did the statements come from? What do they say? And what isn't there yet? And the more we started thinking about this, the more we realized that there is a, a book-length manuscript in here because not only do we need to talk about the instance data that, that you see here, but we also need to talk about the model that underlies the data. And since this is published on WorldCat, this is bibliographic data, but we also need to talk about 
the authority file statements that we've also had a big hand in producing. And in fact, one of the chapters that focuses more precisely on modeling information in library authority files has the first model, the description of the model underlying DOF that has been published. And so we'll walk through that in just a portion of the presentation. So when we started this work, it wasn't obvious that we could get a good running start on the conversion of MARC records to RDF statements by simply distilling these statements into assertions about a fairly small number of common obvious entities like the ones shown here. And this is a slide that you may have seen in other OCLC presentations that have been given at ALA and other venues over the past couple of years. And so what this says in a schematic form is that the statements that underlie the linked data statements published on WorldCat and accessible through WorldCat.org might say things like, Robert Pearson is the author of the work called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance takes place in Montana. It is about fathers and sons, the concept. And so you can just keep going on down the list. These are very simple, obvious, straightforward things that can be distilled from what appears to be a mass of machine-readable data that is hard to get your head around. So more broadly, what we wanted to do when we wrote this book was to tell the story representing the complex technical ideas and the many person years of innovation that went into this work. And we wanted to create a foundation resource from which others can learn so that people could understand what decisions we made and why we made them. And so we can kind of move on from the initial focus to more sophisticated discussion. And in the process of doing this, we needed to talk about many interlocking research projects. And we want to tell the larger story that connects many of these projects. Now, of course, the narrative wasn't outlined in advance, but it grew organically from an intense focus both on our involvement in the development of web standards and in OCLC's role in the management of library data. And it builds on a 20-year history of involvement by OCLC researchers in the development of library and web standards. So with that prologue, I think what we have here on this slide is a statement of what the goals are out of all of that. And they're surprisingly succinct, and they're surprisingly stateable even in the first two bullet points here. So our goal is to develop linked data models of resources managed by libraries, and we want to discover evidence for those models in legacy library data. So here's what this says when we try to unpack it. So on the one hand, we are giving the linked data paradigm a serious test. We're asking questions like, what is the match between linked data and library metadata? So can we express a MARC record in terms of the published vocabularies and linked data? Secondly, how compatible is linked data to the values of librarianship? And finally, how mature are the tools? So we need to find that out to determine whether this is a viable solution for the next generation data architecture for library metadata. So as we thought about this, we realized that a sensible approach was to think in terms of an agile development model that combines modeling with discovery. So what we do is we model for a little while, and then we step back to see if we can discover that in our data. And we iterate that multiple times. And with each iteration, the model gets more detailed. But in the early iterations, we have a clear scope. The scope is to focus on these small numbers of important entities, the ones that are listed on the slide there. And we want to focus on those that appear in library authority files and monographs. And finally, our focus is restricted to the issues that we discover when we publish linked data. Now, of course, in the production of linked data, we have to consume it. But 
but we are primarily interested in, in the technical and conceptual issues that, that come up when, when data is, when we attempt to publish data. And throughout all of this, we want to address two use cases. One is the classic one of the visibility of library resources on the, on the web. And the second one is also a classic one that, that gets at the heart of what OCLC's business mission is, which is to aggregate data to produce WorldCat and VOP and other data resources. But as we got into this more deeply, we realized that data aggregation is actually the solution to the problem of producing good linked data for, for library resources. So as we move from records to statements, what we're doing is creating statements that become ever more detailed about the entities of interest that are in our data. So we'll talk about that quite a bit more in the rest of this presentation. So why do we want to do this? This gets back to the, the web of data versus the web of documents that Tim Berners-Lee and his, and his colleagues have talked about. And this is perhaps the latest iteration of it. So um, if we search for the Library of Congress on Google, we now get these two views. You know, on the left is the familiar document list that, con that contains the phrase, the li Library of Congress. And the, the list, as everyone knows, is ranked according to popularity. So the Library of Congress homepage is the most popular of these because that, that is the document mentioning the Library of Congress that the most documents on the web point to. Now, the thing on the right is something fundamentally different. This is a Google Knowledge Card, and it's a description of this thing called Library of Congress that has been compiled from a data set that Google now calls the, the, the Knowledge Vault. So this is structured data that's been mined from the web, and it includes some of the linked data sets that are shown in the LOD cloud. So um, the result is put into this Knowledge Card, and it contains the attributes that you could imagine somebody caring about when they search for Library of Congress. And so since that's an organization, it has a location on a map, um, it may, others may have pictures of what the building looks like, or hours of, of operation, and so on. Um, and this information is also present in the web of documents, but the, but the user would have to dig through these documents, and often for a long time. So in effect, the machine process that produces that card has already done a lot of the digging for you. Now, the Knowledge Vault is um, growing even as we speak, and now it contains billions of entries that are, that are available not only for organizations such as Library of Congress, but lots of other things. And so, for example, there are common objects, and this is a, a common object about showing the, the knowledge card for a bear, where you find out pertinent facts about bears, the scientific name, um, the, what their, their typical height, and, and so on. And on the right, there's also some additional, or on the left, sorry, there's some, adi some additional mining that has happened to disambiguate the term bear so that we know that it's an animal, we know that, that it can be um, other, it can be the name of a, base, of a team in Chicago and, and so on. So, so the, you'll see a lot of these, and, and it's kind of fun to, to search Google for those. Now, it turns out that Den in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the book that we have in WorldCat, is also a thing. It's an object that you can hold in your hands and buy and sell and trade and check out of the library and that sort of thing. And so it has a knowledge card as well, as well, of course, as a list of documents that contain that term. Now, at this point, though, the, the story starts to darken a little bit, and you can see the the, the work that we have in front of us. Because just as Tim Berners-Lee promised, this data that is now in a machine processable form is also actionable. And we can see here that somebody could search for the Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and find places where they can get that. But what you notice right away is that libraries aren't there. Amazon and Barnes and & Noble are there, but libraries are not in that list, so why not? 
that's one of the big questions that we're trying to answer in the work. Going further, you can discover that not all libraries have good knowledge cards, and this follows up on work that, that Ken and Arlich and his colleagues have done about the development of, of knowledge cards for libraries. And what we're showing here is a deliberately small library. It's, it's, it's a beautiful um, Carnegie Library in a, in a farming town in London, Ohio, just outside of Columbus, that, that has a knowledge card that doesn't say a whole lot about it. Now, Kenning's recommendation to make this better is to first create a website that is more easily crawled so that more structured information can be obtained, and secondly, to create a Wikipedia article which can be harvested and converted into DDpedia, which is then consulted in the Google process that creates structured data here. So there is a problem, but also a solution. And finally, the resources that are in libraries are not represented here. Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is, because that's a, that's a, a bestseller and, and probably a lot of people point to it, so entities get pointed to in the same way that documents do. But if you look for more obscure things, um, you're not going to find knowledge cards typically. So for example, um, if you have a book called a Farewell to Arms Control, for example, which was a book published in 1975 that we have a WorldCat record for. There's no knowledge card there at all. And that's the result that you're going to find over and over again for library material. And so this is the deeper problem that we need to solve, that the, the user typically comes to Google in their search for information, and yet the library world is by and large, not visible enough in that, in that world that they see. So how do we get more, I'm sorry, I want to summarize this a little bit before we move on. Um, so to summarize, we have two very different views of the web, and they coexist, and one does not replace the other because they, they actually have different, they serve different needs. So the web of documents is about gives you web pages or other documents, and the text is human readable, and there's a sense that they're independent. You can read an independent page. Um, in many cases, you can download them. There may be links to other documents, but those are not required. And those documents are static in the sense that all you can really do with them is read them. So in the web of things, um, you have something very different. You have a set of statements about entities or things and you have statements about properties that they have or relationships. Um, this data is machine processable and it's integrated. So the web is an integrated network of statements about these things. And they're actionable because you can then put the data in a form so that you can do things about it. So you can go to the knowledge card for, for Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and then get it from Amazon.com. And that was something that would take a lot more work to do in the web of documents. So why is this important? Well, first of all, maybe most fundamentally, the knowledge card that you saw was a useful application. And it's useful in the sense that it saves the reader's time, which if we could reference a, a book that was published by our colleagues Lynn Conaway and Michelle Samuel last year. This is the first principle in their reordered principles first put forth by, by Rang and Nathan. So this is a big deal. Just the knowledge card itself is a nice application. And we can imagine other applications that, that, are, that are equivalently useful to that. The second thing is that the data produced by linked data principles is understandable to others outside our domain. So it's not just librarians sharing data among each other, but there would be outside groups that would understand our data and be able to do something with it. So that's what's required for libraries to be present in this new world. And in effect, what we're trying to do as we tackle this problem is to create a knowledge vault for libraries. So how do we do that? The, the simple way is to Think is to go into shredding again, and, and this is a, a, a more 
simplified view of how we do this. Um, and what we do is start out with a human readable text, so Hamlet at the bottom, that bid record, and decompose it into entities and relationships that are completely machine understandable. So this says a work has a title named Hamlet. Um, it's published by a publisher, this an organization that's located in New York, and so on. And so by doing that, we're able to create a simplified version of a, of a human-like language that a machine can completely understand. And in doing so, we're also prepared doing the first step towards linked data. And what we would do there is take the entity relationship model and look for as many links as possible, looking for relationships that are real to things that people actually care about. And so we mentioned in the overview that this is a worldwide effort, but the Library of Congress has been especially instrumental in driving this change. And so what these quotes tell us is that the need was recognized early on that we need to modernize the data in our field. And the second quote shows that, that linked data itself has been adopted as a, as a principle that we can work with and is compatible with librarianship. So the big tasks that we have in front of us are to fill the library-shaped hole that our colleague Richard Wallace talks about and then do it with a new generation of machine-readable semantics and do it with linked data. And to talk about this in more detail, I'll turn over the presentation to Jeff. Thanks, Jean. Uh, and thanks, everyone, who uh, has joined us uh, via the interwebs. Um, as Jean mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking more uh, about the models that we've developed here, as well as um, how we've been able to take those models and convert um, our existing records into entities. So to start with a quote, um, computers are dumb. Uh, well, they're not as smart as us anyways. Um, and what this quote uh, is meant to convey is that humans have a, um, a, the ability to understand context when you are talking about things. Um, so the example here is Captain Cook. Um, and we hear that uh, us, as, we as humans, can um, pull together voyages and sailing, all these um, related entities, um, whereas a computer is just going to see that as a string of characters. Um, you know, another example to, um, uh, to highlight this, this issue is um, when humans are talking about jaguars. Um, it's very easy, based on the context of the conversation, to understand whether you're referring to the animal, the jaguar, um, the Jacksonville Jaguars, the sports team, or whether you're referring to the car, jaguar. Um, but again, for computers, this can be very difficult. Um, so the, the effort in our RDF modeling is to provide uh, context to the strings that you find in a MARC record uh, so we can allow computers to better understand the context as you're um, processing through it. So at the basis of our RDF modeling, we chose to use uh, the schema.org vocabulary. Uh, released in 2011 as a collaborative project between Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Yandex, um, the, scheme, the vocabulary allows us to describe bibliographic items in a way that makes them consumable and understandable uh, by the major search engines. Uh, unfortunately, because schema.org is a general purpose vocabulary, it lacks some of the granularity that was necessary to describe the items that you'd find uh, in a library, or bibliographic items, we'll call them. Um, so in order to add that granularity, um, a, an extension vocabulary was developed called bibliograph.net. Um, and used in tandem, uh, we are now able to describe, with the appropriate level of granularity, the bibliographic items you find in worldcat.org. So um, since the release of bibliograph.net, there's actually been discussion within the schema.org community to start to develop domain-specific extension vocabularies under officially sanctioned by the schema.org umbrella. Um, and the bibliograph.net vocabulary, a corpus of that is actually being used and proposed as an official bibliographic extension that would sit under bib.schema.org. And hopefully that will become uh, available over the coming months. So these next couple of slides are going to walk through uh, some use cases, um, two specifically, where we're able to take records and convert them into entities. The first of these use cases is taking a record and shredding it into uh, a work entity. 
So to walk you through basically what we've been able to do, and this is just a small, just three examples of what of what the, the shredding process, quote unquote, actually does. Um, but here we were able to take a 100 personal name main entry, uh, in the case Robert M. Persig, um, a 245 title entry, in this case the Zen, uh, Zen in the Yard of Motorcycle Maintenance, as well as a 650 subject, in this case uh, Fathers and Sons, and actually convert that or shred that, if you will, into either RDF entities that are connected to the, the larger work or um, RDF syn uh, syntax readable, understandable labels. Um, the case here would be uh, the title being um, Zen in the Yard of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and then what these all sort of point to is a, um, a HTML display of what's considered a work. Um, and it should be mentioned that in addition to shredding these mark records into entities, um, the other very important part of deriving works is actually being able to cluster all of the manifestation-y type of things you find in worldcat.org into a single work. So you can take the, we'll just throw out a random number, 500 OCLC records for this particular book and actually be able to point them all to a single work and conversely be able to, if you land on a works description, point back to all the individual manifestation-y type things in worldcat.org. Um, so again, this screenshot just shows you um, the, the HTML service that we've set up for the display of our works data. Um, if you plug in a work ID um, into a browser, you will be taken to this HTML human viewable form, uh, but you can also uh, content negotiate for a variety of RDF serializations, including Turtle, tri and triples, JSON-LD, uh, as well as RDF XML. The next use case I'm going to uh, discuss is taking records and shredding them into person entities. So uh, what we've been able to do through a variety of um, matching algorithms is take, again, that string for Robert M. Persig and actually point over to the VOF entity for that individual. Um, and this is, um, you know, the foundation of this work it was um, in authority control and being able to enhance our WorldCat data so we actually have controlled access points for, um, for applications to use. But what we've, we've been able to do in the RDF work we've been doing recently is then uh, take this controlled string to VOF and then point out to other linked data sets, uh, specifically uh, Wikidata and uh, Wikipedia and conversely DBpedia. And what this allows us to do then is actually acquire or aggregate a larger number of language-specific strings for that individual, um, as well as provide uh, context and even, in some instances, biographical information about those individuals, which you can imagine being very useful for next-generation discovery services. So in order to create person entities, you need to obviously have a model for people. Um, and librarians have been managing personal names, labels for, for quite a long time. Um, so here's an example from the uh, Getty ULAN thesaurus um, for personal uh, union lists of artist names. Um, here this happens to be Abraham Lincoln, and you can see that this looks very much like a traditional thesaurus entry. You have preferred labels, you have display labels, uh, you have its position, its hierarchical position within the thesaurus. Um, so this is very um, reminiscent of how uh, libraries have typically managed uh, personal name strings. So when work began to convert these controlled vocabularies into RDF, um, the natural vocabulary of choice was SCOS, which was an RDF vocabulary that was developed to encode resources that are typically found in the SORI lists, dictionaries, et cetera. So what this resulted in was um, something like this, where you'd have a URI that's classified as a SCOS concept, and then it had properties associated with it that were uh, reflective of its uh, the source entry background, like preferred labels, alternative labels, et cetera. When we started modeling people, uh, we found that this, this approach was um, at times problematic, uh, and it was particularly problematic to people who lived outside of a uh, library world. And the root of that issue is that Abraham Lincoln is a real person, or at least he was a real person. Uh, so it can be slightly confusing to 
people outside the library domain or computers that are trying to process this information when you see a person classified as a concept. So in our model, lean work, uh, we tried our best to reflect reality. And what that resulted in is a model in which um, people are classified as people, things are places are places, events are events, etc. So here's an example from our VOP data, um, which was the first manifestation of this sort of new view of people. Um, we originally used the faux vocabulary. Uh, recently, we've converted over to using schema.org. Um, the semantics between them is not, was not a major change. Um, but as you can see here, uh, this VOP entity is classified as a person. Uh, and, and if you were to look at the full description, you would see properties associated with it that are reflective of him being a real person, like a name, a death date, a birth date, a place of birth, et cetera. So just to confirm that this is an appropriate uh, way to model Abraham Lincoln as a person, even though he is te technically no longer a living person, uh, the definition for person in schema.org is um, a person, alive, dead, undead, or fictional. So um, as, as the case may be, Pinocchio was and always will be a real person, at least within the context of schema.org's reality. So the way this uh, manifested itself in the VOF data uh, is that we at the we at the center we have this VOF entity that's classified as a real person, and then in order to link out to the control vocabularies which are form the corpus for VOF, um, we use a property called faux focus. Um, so basically, what you end up having is this what we commonly refer to as a hub and spoke model, where at the center is the real person, and then on the peripheries pointing back into the real person are the control vocabulary string names from a variety of organizations. And this both focus pro property was um, actually created as a way to connect the conceptualization of something, in this case, the Scott concept. Uh, for Abraham Lincoln that might be found in the Library of Congress name authority file and actually point it to the thing itself, in this case, the VOF person entity. So uh, just to briefly go over, this is, um, uh, Jean talked about this briefly uh, in, our, in the preceding sections. Uh, this is sort of the model we have for creative works. You can quickly see the sort of key entities that were discussed earlier. We have creative works, person, organizations, places, um, and we basically now have a way to map all these things together to um, form a more coherent, machine understandable, and processable view of our data. And what's slightly more interesting then is um, how that model um, translates into instance data. Um, so again, using the Zen of Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance as an example. On the bottom portion of the screen, you can see an entity that is classified as a creative work and also as an individual product um, to signify that this is something that you could go to a library and find or, or buy from a bookstore or you know something that's tangible that you can hold in your hand. And then connected to that entity, you have a person uh, which happens to be related via creator, property, um, as well as an organization uh, which is connected to it via a published publisher property. Um, and then at the top of the screen, you have a, another creative work. And this is where the, the works clustering comes in. Uh, so these two creative works are connected to each other via an example of work property and a work example. So you have this um, multi-directional connection between the work and the creative work, uh, the, excuse me, the work and the manifestation-y thing, and vice versa. So um, if, uh, we, if we divide this into sort of phase one and phase two, phase two being what um, I'll discuss next, um, phase one, the big tasks for phase one are converting string-based descriptions into real-world objects. Um, second, representing an actionable view of the domain of library resources and the transactions involving them. Uh, so Gene mentioned this earlier, um, but it has to do with making markup um, that, was, that is consumable by search engines and possibly even actionable from within a search uh, search engine search interface. Um, and lastly, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is build a foundation for future development. Um, so obviously right now we've, we've done the modeling um, and we're continuing to do the modeling. We're producing the instance data, um, but the real, the next part is, is 
how can we get this stuff on the web, make it actionable, and also how can we get this stuff in applications and make it useful for um, library-specific applications and services. So briefly, um, the, the second phase I, that I alluded to a few minutes ago is, um, is text mining for entities and relationships. Um, and this is a, a, a monumental task. Um, so just to give a give you a perspective, um, all of the previous work that uh, that I've discussed had to do with creating entities from authority controlled strings. So we were able to, through our data enhancement processes, processes, know that this string relates to this actually you know, relates to this VAUF entity, or this string relates to this fast concept. Um, and so in this sort of uh, circle diagram, that would be considered the very top layer, the names of identifiers, of which in WorldCat there are approximately 16 million. Um, and the next layer out is our, our label names. Uh, so this is where you would have, um, for example, a, a record for a journal article in which the title is mentioned or the person is mentioned. And of those that have no identifiers, there are approximately 39 million in WorldCat. So you can see this exponential growth. And we don't have exact numbers for the, uh, the last two categories, but they are exponentially larger than the previous two. Um, the third ring out are names and semi-structured free text. Um, and this is where you might find a, a 245 subfield C uh, for a translator. Um, you know, the task there is not only understanding that that is a person, um, but also understanding that that's a person you know, that has a relationship to the creative work that is translator. And then to compound the problem even more, um, you need to deal with string names that are in various languages so, uh, the, uh, in, or different scripts, being able to rationalize that, uh, okay, we understand this person's a translator, but can we rationalize that person in record A is the same as the person in record B um, if their names are um, vary by language. And then the last section, and by far the largest section, are names in uh, unstructured free text. So this is where you might have genre-specific notes fields, uh, such as performers um, in a, a musical performance or uh, members of a disser dissertation committee for a thesis. Um, so again, these are where you need to not only parse out all of the um, um, unnecessary text, but specifically then find people or organizations, as well as the relationship that those strings have uh, back to the creative work. So uh, some of the major tasks for what, uh, what I referred to as phase two is reaching beyond controlled access points and mark records and then be able to identify entities and more importantly, identify the relationship between entities. Um, the second task uh, is improving the feedback loop for discovering entities. Um, thirdly is uh, clustering and disambiguation. Uh, and finally is, is linking the data sets outside those managed by the library community. Uh, I mentioned those briefly with uh, Wikidata and DDpedia, but as Jean mentioned early in her presentation, the, the semantic web is, is mad, the cloud is massive, and there's many, many other data sets that we could link back out to. So for the conclusion, I'll turn it back over to Jean. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, that was good. So, I just want to run through briefly some of the results, and it should only take about five minutes, and then we can start with some questions. Um, so what are the outcomes of this work? So what does our portion of the cloud begin to look like? So first of all, we can say that we've got, like, like McDonald's and the billions and billions of triples instead of McDonald's cell. Um, and these end up being among the oldest and largest and most referenced linked data stores in the library sector of the linked data cloud. And we know a little bit more about this because of some work that our colleague Karen Smith Yoshimura is doing by surveying users of, of linked data in the library community. And these are some of her results. So she conducted her research in September of 2014, and she elicited 72 respondents. She's about to reissue that, that 
survey, which will make part of the book obsolete, but we'll deal with that. Um, but what we found there was that not only these results about OCLC, but we also learned that there's international interest in linked data, and there are many emerging data sets, and among those emerging data sets would be WorldCat works. So they would be emerging in the sense that people are interested in them, um, they know that they're around, but they haven't been linked to enough yet so that they, ha they have an appearance in the linked data cloud. But what we also know is that the cloud is still organizing itself, and people are still trying to figure out what this is. There are a lot of small data sets. There are a lot of people publishing. Relatively fewer people are consuming each other's data, and that's a problem that we know we're going to have to, to respond to. And we also know that we need to do more interlinking outside the library and bibliographic sector of the linked data world. So we know that there's still a lot of work that, that remains to be done. So what are some of our next steps? So given the, the agile style of development we have, we know a lot about what our next technical development needs, next rounds of technical development need to focus on. So we know, for example, that the models for our key entities need to be refined. We know that we need to focus on the, the development of models for resources other than published monographs. We've done some very nice work led by Karen Smith Yoshimura on internationalization, and that will show some results. And we also know, though, that we have long-term goals, and, th and this moves beyond the day-to-day -day work of doing technical development. So we need to interoperate more with, with other community efforts. And in this regard, um, we're working with um, the Library of Congress to, to advance our understanding of, of what is common between the modeling work that OCLC is doing and, and the bid framework. Um, we know that we need to carry out more formal studies of linked data's impact, and there are collaboration with, with Kenning R, which will, will um, be the venue for a lot of that work. And we also know that now that we have um, baseline results that we can begin to think about creating a new generation of services that improve the discovery and delivery of library resources. And as we work, we know that the linked data paradigm is this journey. And along the way, there are benefits that accrue. So if you can imagine that we're at the bottom with a lot of machine, a, a lot of human readable text, the first thing that we're going to get would be cleaner and more normalized data. And then we end up with semantics that is more understandable by machines than it currently is. And then a, a later result might be applications that don't have to have hard-coded knowledge of our, of our data. The data describes itself. Then we would end up with data that can be understood outside the context in which we created it. So those are all really nice things. But above that red line is what we're really after. We're after that active or actionable data. We're after better syndication and visibility of our, of our data on the web. But the triangle in the background represents where the effort is and where the results have been. And so we still have a way to go as we go down this, this path. And so I'll close here with, a, with another quote from, from Kenning Arlitz, where he says that if we want to undertake this task, then we really do need to make a concerted effort to ensure that our, our metadata is interoperable with web standards. And we need to publish to those platforms that people use in their quest for information. So a final footnote about the book. It's been published by Morgan Claypool. Um, the print version is out. But given that this is a fast-moving story and a difficult subject to nail down in a book-length work, it's good to know that, that more, this publisher also has an agile development model. So many of, there will be many e-versions of, of the book that will be coming online soon. And those are, are things that can be modified as, as we incorporate new development. And to close, I'll say that it's already on WorldCat and the link to the Thank you.
So at this time, we will take questions via chat. I see uh, quite a few have come through. So for those of you who haven't submitted your questions yet, please do so now. So we'll start taking them. Yes, and Shang Wei, feel free to please um, join in if you'd like to answer any of these questions. Um, so let's start with the first question here is from Gleb Garwaljuk, and I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. <laughs> what method did you use for clustering entities from different data sets or sources? That, that's a good question, and it gets described in the book. Um, and the, the, the methods for clustering entities are, are among those, those um, resources that we were able to derive from the work of our, of our colleagues in, in research that preceded the, the link data work. So um, we, we have methods for clustering works, for example, that, that look at commonalities among author and title. And, and it gets more complicated from there, but some of the algorithm is described in one of the chapters of the book. Um, the, the, the methods for clustering people have to do with person name strings that we discover in um, library authority data, and we want to associate with that the, the most reliable facts about about that person. So that would be birth and death dates, the works that they authored. And so that's at, at the foundation, those are the those are what our clustering algorithms are based on. Thank you. Okay, let's see here. How does schema or bibliograph relate to bibframe? Is it an alternative to it or could it base itself on it? And that's from Martin Kelleher. Okay. Okay, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that because this is a, a, a an issue that we've tried to to a, a address throughout the development of of our modeling work. So um, our work with schema.org actually predated the appearance of, of BibFrame by maybe a few months, but but it was ongoing when when BibFrame had been announced, and we knew at the beginning that that BibFrame had um, some commonalities with schema in the sense that it's also about, about these key entities such as creative works and organizations and people and so on. And so we made an effort to align our models of those key entities with what would be published in, in BibFrame. And when we saw differences in how those models Period, we tried to discuss that with our colleagues in, in the Library of Congress. And so that effort to align our modeling work started in 2013 and it continues. So Ray, Ray Denenberg and I just published an, an, an article about the relationships between the two models and there will be a second paper that has the, the technical details of that. But but one thing that we can conclude from this is that we're addressing different use cases. So OCLC is fundamentally trying to do experiments with the linked data paradigm based on the use case of discoverability, whereas BibFrame is, is about trying to create a next generation version of, of MARC that, that will address use cases that include discoverability, but also include um, problems with the curation of library resources. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Sylvia Southwick. How do you deal with false name match with VOF or any other authority file? So, uh, yeah, and so that's an interesting question. Uh, and it, and it, it, to, to go back to the uh, what Jean mentioned about the, the modeling process being iterative, um, this, this matching is also an iterative process, um, obviously getting better um, a, a, as you can continue to refine the algorithms. Um, so, so right now, uh, in order to create the, to fix those false matches, uh, you need to fix the clustering algorithm that's or the matching algorithms that are used. Um, so what we've tended to do is err on the side of caution and not match where we're, we're only match where we're pretty confident and not match where we're not. Um, 
but as you move from the world of matching within bibliographic records to matching entities in RDF, um, you can begin to actually leverage the power of RDF um, syntax to make better guesses as to what entities should be matched together. So you can begin to do data mining to find out that this individual has written, um, a, wrote a book in 1882, and this other individual who we think might be the same wrote a book in 1972. Uh, if you just look at the data and analyze it, clearly that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, you know, someone could not have lived that long and published on that far into the spectrum. Um, and you can also, when you start looking at, at unify or, or closely related publication dates, you can also begin to look at what types of subjects were used, uh, were written about, where it was published, what language it was published in. Um, so um, I guess um, to, to answer your question, moving forward, what we're going to be able to do is leverage the statements that are actually being produced through the RDF to make better assumptions as to what we should or should not say are the same entities. Thank you. Okay, um, and Shang Wei, I see that you posted a comment there, so in case you're unable to unmute, I'll, I'll read that for you. Um, we have also been experimenting, experimenting with statistical methods to clustering entities. Based on the context where entities occur in the corpus, it is possible to compute the relatedness between entities. Please check out our publication at, and then she posted the uh, location of the publication there in the chat, so thank you. Um, let's see, we have a couple other questions. I would like to find where I am here, sorry. Okay, from Grace Yee. How can you handle the popular names? For example, same names as the same institution in the same research area. I would like to have Shang Wei answer that question because that addresses the research that she's doing right now. So can you do that? So, so, Sheng Wei, can you get online or not? If not, I can summarize it. And so basically, if you have a, a bunch of popular names that are, that are similar, that really shows the, the need and the benefit of the of this sort of context-based um, comparisons that Sheng Wei's research is doing now. So if you have uh, John Smith, and you have, you know, hundreds of them. You can. It, it, it's futile to look at the names themselves. You, it's more productive to look at the the um, context of the documents in which John Smith appears. And so you may begin to discover that this John Smith over here has done a lot of work in geology, and this John Smith over here is an athlete, and and then and you can produce clustering results that, that emerge from, from that analysis that, that show the distinct entities that are revealed in the data. Hi, hi can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think this question is really, really difficult even for people, for human to judge. Because it's the same name, same institution, same research area, it's really difficult, I mean, for even very smartest boy, human to, to figure it out. But if it has the same name, uh, even the same institu institution, but working on different area, based on statistic method, as Jean said, um, study what kind of vocabulary or they wrote about, then it's possible to to distinguish the there were the same stream associated with different um, research topics. So that's what we are experimenting and using statistics methods to find relations between entities or disambiguate names uh, entities. Thank you, Sheng Wei, and thank you all for joining us. Unfortunately, we are out of time. There are a couple of questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, so we will answer those online and also um, email those of you who ask the questions directly with the answers. 
So um, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation, and we will post the recording and the slides of this webinar online shortly. Um, thanks again, and this concludes today's webinar.